tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Turn with me to 1 Peter. We're going to pick up here. We left off there before I went to Saudi Arabia, and then we recorded one or two lessons, so we're back. I think we've only done two lessons on video from 1 Peter, so we're going to pick up in chapter 3, and I am... I enjoy teaching this way. It's fun to kind of hit this in a stride and attack it. And it helps us to also see some of our favorite verses in the proper context. There's, to some degree, let me balance it, to some degree there's nothing wrong with taking a scripture out of context if you first know the context and you can properly place it there. That way you don't take it too far out of context. And so like the one that's coming to mind right now is Philippians 4. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Wonderful verse. The, the, the one time I heard it that really tickled me was watching the Olympics 20 years ago. And some I was watching the diving competitions or something. And, and it was a, a young girl just won the gold and I was proud of her. They put the mic in her face. She just wins the gold. And she says, I just, how, what do you, you know, you just won the gold. And she said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. She testifies of Jesus, wonderful. But if that's what that verse means, then I should go compete. <laughs> now, I'm not knocking her. You know, she's probably an 18-year-old kid. Olympians are usually late teenagers, early 20-year-olds. The context is contentment and sacrificial giving and going without. That's the context of Philippians 4. But that's a verse we love to take out of context it sounds really good quoting it, and if we really believed it, we would stop whining so much because we would really be able to do all things through Christ. But, again, we give that young, uh, she's probably 40 now, we give that young Olympian a little bit of leeway to testify of Jesus. And, but honestly, if, if all things means Olympic diving, and then Marlon, let's do it, man. <laughs> Maybe belly flop contest, but... <laughs> I don't even think we would win that. There's some big old boys out there. So studying Peter in any kind of epistle, you can study it exegetically and make the individual letter your entire text so you see it in the context of what it is so that every verse then is taken in the context. And once you understand the bigger setting, then it's all right to come along and turn the scriptures from another angle and then do a topical study and let's say you want to do a topical study on the devil. Well, you can find verses in 1 Peter that talk about the devil, but the bigger context is Peter writing to the church. All this to say, study your Bible. Do a little bit more than a 15-minute daily devotional. Brother Hagen was fond of saying, uh, Americans, Christians, will feed themselves three hot meals a day and feed their walk with him, walk with Jesus, one cold snack a week. What if we were to eat the Word of God as much as we pack on the calories? Wouldn't be, wouldn't be, would, would, wouldn't we be a lot healthier spiritually if we actually like plowed into the Word of God and didn't just do some like Bible Hub devotional? I'm not knocking it. If that's all you got, I mean that's like a POW getting a Snickers bar once a week. But you could be a lot stronger if you plowed a little bit deep, diff, uh, deeper. And as I've been exhorting lately. Every one of us needs to be a better student of God's Word. We're all at a different level. Jump in where you're at and just start studying. Just start reading your New Testament. Go back and read the Bible stories from your childhood, but start with something. Don't let this be a teaching church and you be illiterate. And don't ever say, well, my pastor says, that's fine. I can be wrong. What does your God say to you? And he has something daily bread. He has something he wants to give you from his word daily. But if all you ever do is wait to church to open your Bible and don't study anything in between, please know that you're not right with God in that area. We need to all be in the word of God, men and women. And as we've been saying, women tend to be the worst Bible students. There are some really good women Bible students, but women, generally speaking, in our nation are horrible Bible students. And it may be because they're so busy keeping home and, and governing the home, so there's so many things. But ladies, you have to make time 
for your God in the scriptures. I would encourage you, some of you are avid readers, I wouldn't read anything secular until you've read the Bible first. And maybe do like some folks do with their kids. Earn your free read with Bible read. For every minute you study your Bible, you earn one minute reading something non-biblical. That'll dry up a lot of other nonsensical stuff too because I know you're not going to read the Bible a lot. <laughs> but at least you'll dry up some of that nonsensical carnality and that'll help you too. All right. So study your Bible. So 1 Peter 3, or chapter 3, let's review real quick. This is Peter writing to the strangers scattered about uh, basically what is Turkey or Asia Minor. And the whole subject of Peter is suffering and persecutions. He, chapter 1 goes on to talk about manifold temptations and the trial of your faith. And you're in this season by the will of God. And if need be, you've purified your soul. And a lot of stuff that the word of faith doesn't really like to acknowledge because it isn't really hyper-faith doctrine. It's just biblical doctrine that there are seasons for suffering and we should embrace it and just sit there like Abraham in the heat of the day in the door of his tent and go, man, it's hot. But here comes Jesus on the horizon. Quit fleeing hardship. Quit fleeing hardship. Quit fleeing hardship. Droughts will teach your roots to go deeper. If all you ever do is run from hardship, you are a shallow Christian. If you always take the easier option, you'll be a shallow Christian. If you always take the easier option, you'll be a weak human being, and that's not our calling. We're, in called, to, we're called to endure hardness like a good soldier for Christ. That doesn't feel good on your emotions, but it's good for you spiritually. We don't turn to God enough. We have learned how to flee anything hard so we don't have to need anything. It is a carnal desire called fight or flight. We don't even know how to fight anymore. We just run away. We run to mama's house. We run to social media. We run to comfort food. You forgot about a comfort God because he wasn't as delicious as chocolate cake or Rocky Road, but he's also a lot more slimming. Whoever you run to in time of need, whatever you do in your time of hostility and your time of trial reveals to you your faith. If you run to mama, she's your goddess. If you run to social media, that's your sacred book. If you run to food, there's your idol. There's your daily bread. There's your manna. If you run to the scriptures, if you run to prayer, if you run to the house of God, if your first thought is, I need to get in prayer, you've just revealed you have some grit about you and some spirituality about you. So this big overall subject of Peter is, you're suffering, so what? Here's how you glorify God. And what we find, as we said the last couple two services where we taught on this, you don't see hugs given out in 1 Peter to the strangers scattered abroad through a persecution. They are not Jews in Israel. They're now Jews in Gentile lands under the Roman Empire. They are no longer in their businesses. They're no longer in their hometowns. They're no longer at their estates. They're now migrants. That's not easy. Maybe they speak Greek. Maybe they speak Aramaic. Maybe all they're speaking is Hebrew, but it's a rough go. And Peter never once stops and says, oh, nobody knows the troubles you've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Peter says, this is good for you. Yes, sir. We lost lands. This is good for you. Because didn't Jesus say, you'll lose lands from me. You'll get it more in this life and that which is to come. Amen. Peter never rallies a protest. He never gets out the vote. He says, look, if need be, the trial of your faith is much more precious than gold that perishes. And he says, and you know what? On top of all this, you can rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, joy, let's hit on this real quick. Joy is a great indication of how strong your faith is. And if you have strong faith in Christ, strong faith in God Almighty, no matter what's going on behind the scenes, that joy level never dips. And you can tell you're really doing a good job with God Almighty when people can't even tell you're going through something. And it's not a facade. It's not a poker face. It's a joy face. And yes, life stinks right now. And yes, life is hard, but whew, it's flaring up again. But I'm going to go get with God here in a few minutes. I'm going to excuse myself from the dinner table at my friend's house. And I'm going to go pray in tongues for a moment build myself up in my most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost like the Bible commands 
And then I'm going to say, Lord, thank you for this day. I'm alive. I've got the word of God in my heart, breath in my lungs. I can change anything. What am I to be mopey about? But let me tell you, if your face is like one of them Indian weather rocks, You know those Indian weather rocks? You get them over in Cherokee. So some of you don't know Indian weather rocks. This is what we picked up all the time in the 80s on field trips. I think they're a little racist, but back then we didn't care. That was a stone that could hurt you, not the words, right? So the Indian weather rock, you could buy it in Cherokee, North Carolina. That's the home of Indians. <laughs> Came on this little square thing, and it had like a little teepee which I felt was probably a little racist too since Cherokees don't live in teepees. They live in longhouses, if you know your anthropology, right? <laughs> teepees, that's on the plains. They live in longhouses because Cherokees weren't nomadic like the Plains Indians. But you had to have a little tripod. And then from it was a little leather strap and a rock that was tied to it. And this is called the Indian weather rock. And it was a weather pr predictor. So how does it work? Well, and it was engraved on there. If the rock is wet, it's raining. If the rock is hot, it's sunny. If the rock is white, it's snowy. If the rock is gone, it's bad weather. <laughs> and some of your faces are just like that. We know exactly what you're going through because your face asks for attention. And sometimes we just wish it was bad weather. good preaching already. But the real mark of maturity is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Like, like Paul and Silas whipped in chains, brutalized for nothing but preaching the gospel. And they still have the ability to sing songs. Paul has given up all this hierarchy of pharisaical life and Benjamite tribe. And yet, He's been abused by his own people and just singing praise songs. When your face looks like a hatchet and it's as bra abrasive as sandpaper, you're not singing songs. And you know what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes you can't, or Proverbs? You can't even sing songs to that person because they won't receive it. It says you can't sing songs to a heavy heart because they don't want it. They just want to spoil everybody else's life. And it's hard to help people like that. But Peter says, look, joy unspeakable, full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Chapter 2 comes along and says, hey, it's going to get rough. And you lay aside all malice and guile, hypocrisies. That means no matter how rough it gets, watch how you behave. And then it goes on to say, listen, in all this persecution, you need to submit yourselves to every man's ordinance. You're telling folks who are refugees and immigrants, been run out of Jerusalem for their faith, and a great persecution arising from the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they're going into a new territory with new laws. And Peter says, submit, obey. You're no longer in your home country. You're now strangers scattered abroad. Asia Minor, this is not your culture. You're not one to travel. But you know what? In those new lands, shut up, submit. And that's what chapter 2 says. Uh, submit yourselves to every man's ordinance. Uh, to the, every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to king as supreme or to governors as those that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of them that do well. And then it goes on to talk about honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, uh, honor the king. Then it says slaves. Whew. We're not slaves in Jerusalem anymore. Now we're slaves in Asia Minor. So now I get to say serve an honorary Hebrew, who's upset, but he took me with him. And he's saying, uh, serve your masters with all fear. We might church it up a little bit. Say, employees, serve your bosses with all fear. Not only to the good and to the gentle, but also to the froward. Serve both the jerk boss and the good boss. Serve the jerk owner and the good owner. We are really so fickle as Americans. Uh, the redneck mindset of our region is I was looking for a job when I found this one, which means I'm about to quit this one. And you're going to have a, a job resume, a CV, as long as a middle school's dating CV, probably longer, and have nothing to show for your 401k or your social security because you just go from one minimum wage job to the next because you can't handle being treated rough. But listen, that employer needs you to work, so shut up and work. And if he yells at you, why were you such a bad employee? I don't, 
I don't get employers having to apologize to their employees. I pay you to take it, so shut up and take it. Like, we want to complain. All right, let me know when you're done and you can go home. Because you were looking for a job when you found this one. And there's 10 more people lined up for yours. And they're happy to work. I think I told you years ago I was on a job site. And the concrete contractor said, man, I wish we could find a recession. I said, why? He said, because you can get good workers when there's a recession. He said, this was in the early 2000s. The economy was running pretty hot. Everybody was hiring, so there was no good workers to be had. So he was having to hire scum, which cost you more money. He said, man, I wish we could go into a recession so I could get better help. Please know, there's always somebody better than you wanting your job. And you can be replaced with a, with a boss's click or text. So how about we obey Peter and not the American TikTok generation and say, Lord, thank you for my job. I am sorry I upset my boss. Why is he frustrated with me? And if he's upset with you, probably everybody else in your life is. We forget this concept that work is a privilege and a gift given by God. It gives us something that can perfect many areas of our lives. It gives us something else to believe him for. The, the daily strength, the daily wisdom, the opportunity to be a witness to co-workers and to fellow uh, employees and to the world we might interact with. We're acting like we're doing God and our boss a favor by even showing up. And that's such a wretched mindset Labor is a gift from God, and you are blessed to be able to do some. It's the will of God from the garden. Before there was sin, before there was a curse, there was a job. And Adam got to know God through that job. And I think this modern generation and the socialists of the previous generation, they just think, you know, we ought to just congratulate you and thank you for showing up. If you can't be on time, you're probably of no good to me. Amen. If you can't be on time, you're probably of no good to me. And you're of no good to your boss. And he'll find somebody who's at least thankful enough to be on time. So be good to your boss, it says. And, and for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. We are allergic to being afflicted. We don't want to suffer wrong for nothing. Our, our American spirit is we'll go to war, we'll go to fight. I grew up in the 80s. Man, there were fights on the playground every day in second grade. What kind of wretched human being trains their seven-year-old to fight on the playground? Don't take nothing off that kid. All right, you're going to teach your kid to go to prison? If he's a bully in second grade, he's going to be a bully in fifth grade. He's going to be a bully in 12th grade. He's going to get shot in college. When you breed a punk, you raise a punk, and a punk becomes a criminal who dies early or goes to prison and becomes a wretched sorrow to his mother. Why, why are we so allergic to being done wrong? Jesus Christ was done wrong his entire earthly existence. And Peter goes on to tell us about that. Verse 21 says, we're called to be done wrong to. That's so un-American. Part of your calling is to be mistreated. Hey, listen, we're Tennesseans, man. <laughs> we're white trash. Unless you're black, then you're different colored. I can't speak for you. My privilege card <laughs> only goes so far. <laughs> Dr. James, he is um, he's black. Um, we're going to let him be called white trash. I mean... I, I, it's my privilege. I dub thee <laughs> white trash. We're, look, this is Tennessee. My point is we're rednecks. We're not just Americans. We're gun-toting, truck-driving, possum-killing, dog-shooting. This is a generalization. Tobacco-spitting, fighting, biting, cussing. Got to have a, a rebel flag somewhere and an American flag. And we're watching NASCAR and WWE. And, uh, but we, we watched it when it was WWF before them animals got upset and sued us. <laughs> and it's real. <laughs> and and we, we're not going to, I ain't dang no, I'm going to let nobody do me wrong. I ain't going to let nobody do my boy wrong. I'm going to teach them to be white trash just like me. So he can go just as far as I didn't go. 
We want dental work early, right, Dr. James? I want that kid's teeth knocked out early. I'll work you back in there somewhere. I will say Dr. James is racist. He offers dentures. I am preaching. He doesn't advertise on the hip-hop station in town. He advertises on the country giant. And that's a smart man. He knows his clientele. He doesn't specialize in gold-plated, platinum-coated grills. That's for the hip-hop station. But he'll catch them on the backside when their teeth rot out, and they'll be listening to the country giant. <laughs> I'm so glad we can be free and not even care because our citizenry is in heaven, not the hood or the trailer park. So let's read this here, verse 20, before I get to chapter 3, because you guys are slowing me down. I don't know what your problem is. We're going to fight later. <laughs> verse 20 says, it, This is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable for God. For even hereunto were you called. You're called to be mistreated. And white trash and ghetto thugs can't handle any disrespect. So let's make it equal here. White trash and ghetto thugs have been trained by wretched parents. You're not going to disrespect me. Well, I have news for you, pumpkin and t boz <laughs> Oh, it's lively tonight. <laughs> but I got my African jammies on, so I'm splitting continents here. I need to wear one of these with my kilt. Just represent everything I am. <laughs> Your God calls you to be mistreated. And that is so antithetical to the American spirit, to the Southern tradition, to the inner city tradition, to human nature. But Paul, excuse me, Peter says it. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. When's the last time you were like Jesus and that you took mistreatment with joy? That's hard on us. It's hard on our ego. We go home, we stew over it. Our blood boils, we make fists. We, we think, man, if I was sharper, I could have said something better. We want to get our comeuppance. But this verse says we're called to be mistreated. Everybody wants their apostolic calling, their prophetic calling, their prophetess calling, their missions calling. What about the calling to be mistreated? Because you're righteous, mistreated because you're holy, mistreated because you're clean, mistreated just because people are jerks. If you can't handle that, you're never going to serve Jesus well. Because anytime a little bit of mistreatment flares up your carnal side, you're going to backslide. God's going to remove the anointing off you that was building, and you're going to start over at the back of the line. And the devil's going to watch how you respond to mistreatment and says, I know exactly how to keep them where I want them, in the back of the line. Anytime they repent, start to get some momentum in Christ, I'm going to send somebody else to mistreat them because they've not matured to the level that Jesus has called them to. So I'm just going to keep them. I'm going to let them get two or three people up in line. Then I'm going to send an offender and send them to the back of the line again. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of American Christians will die is at the back of the line with a sour attitude because you ain't going to treat me bad. Well, how many folks have you stomped on your whole life? This passage, Peter's like, you see no sympathy from Peter. You're scattered. You're not in your home country. You're not in your business. You don't even have your house anymore. You've taken all your possessions as much as you could. Now you're in Turkey, Asia Minor, and it's tough. And guess what? This is your calling. No hugs, no sympathy. No, let's open up the border and return the migrants back home. Nope. Serve Jesus where you're found today. Quit whining and belly aching about it. <clears throat> Verse 22, Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, that means disrespected, he disrespected not again. That's hard. We are such mouthy people as a culture. We are so mouthy. We got to get our jabs in. We kind of brag about it. We post about it. We like to get around our buddies and say, let me tell you what I told them. I gave them a piece of my mind. And Brother Hagen would have said, it's shame you're giving away something you don't have much left of. 
When Jesus suffered, he threatened not. I think most Southern American Christians would fail that because we got to defend ourselves and threaten. But he committed himself to him that judges righteously. And that's where we need to be found. Even when the boss is mistreating you, commit yourself to Jesus. Say, yes, sir, I'm sorry. Forgive me. What can I do better? When the professor mistreats you, when the police officer mistreats you, you name it, any authority in the land, when they mistreat you, yes, sir, please forgive me. Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. I'll fall on that sword. What can I do better? Why are we threatening? Why do we let that get us? This is where our culture has really hurt us. We're, we're willing to fight for things that aren't even fight worthy. And when there are fight worthy things, we're cowards and run from it. You'll stand up for your family name, but not the name of Jesus. You'll stand up for your family's honor, which there is none, but you won't stand up for the name of God and his honor. I don't get that. You'll stand up if they mistreat your son, but not if they slander your God on the job. I, I don't get the hypocrisy, the shallowness, but it may be come back to the fact that we're not really students of the word. We're just students of Sunday morning. So he gives us this example of suffering. And then chapter three, I'm going to skip over uh, who is being, um, by whose stripes we were healed, because then it goes into a salvific passage. But then it changes. But the continuation thought is suffer well, suffer well, suffer well. Chapter three, verse one, marriage. <laughs> suffer well. So we want to get that giant context running into chapter three, verse one, because it says, likewise, you wives. Likewise, what? Likewise, the slave or the employee being evil and treated by their boss or their owner. Suffer well. I've had to deal with a lot of marriages. I used to think I could fix any marriage. I was deceived. I can only fix marriages if both people are humble and would admit where they're wrong. I was meeting with a couple in the last six months and I was trying to help them. And I told them, I said, your guy's problem is you keep blaming each other. And I said, my friend, Dr. Miklos always says, da, 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 da. And in that moment, Dr. Miklos called me and I was like, well, look at there. So I said, let's answer Dr. Miklos all the way from Canada. Dr. Miklos, hey, brother. Hey, I'm meeting with the couple right now. What's that thing you always say? He said, and his answer is, I said, about marriage. And he said, uh, if you're looking for me to fix your partner, I cannot fix your marriage. Because in your marriage, you're the problem. And if you're looking for me, Dr. Miklos speaking, he's a licensed psychologist, PhD in psychology. If you're looking for me to fix your mate, if you've come to marriage counseling for me to fix your mate, you're the problem and I can't fix this marriage. So go away. So we tried to help them with that. I'm not sure how successful we were, but I'm like, look at that. In fact, I keep waiting for him to call right now because I keep saying his name, Dr. Miklos, Dr. Miklos, Dr. Miklos. <laughs> Suffer well. This is the message to wives. Not very feel good. Pastor Kerry just texted, so that's good right there. All right. <laughs> Didn't say his name, but he must not be in church tonight. I don't know what he's doing. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, just like slaves be in subjection to your masters, whether they're good or bad. I've had a lot of folks come to me and want a divorce from their spouse, but I have to tell them there's no grounds for biblical divorce here. You're just miserable and you're throwing fire, uh, fuel on the fire, and then you're upset that you're burned. I mean, you can do what you want, but I'm not going to endorse it. Be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, that is the word of God, and I'm sorry if you married someone who was not obeying the word of God, don't expect them to start obeying the word of God. This is why I'm big on tapping the brakes and proving dating relationships for as long as possible. In 17 years of pastoring, I never get any more blowback than when I tell single couples, tap the brakes. I've had Jezebels. I've had wolves come through this church. I've had hirelings come through this church. Nobody has caused me as much grief as telling my own kids in this church, slow down. Because people, when they're in love, that stupid sense becomes super heightened. Their IQ is cut by 80%. And they put on blinders. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I'll say it again. Pastor Caleb says, love makes you stupid. 
And you were barely ripping it up before you were in love. <laughs> and she shows you attention or he shows you attention. I like, 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 like. The Bible says, like a dumb animal led to the slaughter. So that dark pierces you. I don't know how I got here. You quit listening to the smart people in your life. <laughs> if they can't, if they won't obey the word before you're married, they're not going to obey the word after you're married. Don't marry people who disobey the word. Don't marry Sunday morning only Christians. Don't marry church hoppers. These are folks that hop from church to church to church. These are unstable souls. My God, put down roots and be planted somewhere. You can't build a career hopping jobs every year, but some folks hop churches more than that. We call them church floozies, church tramps. They just hop from church to church to church to church to church to church. That's unstable. It's not praiseworthy. It's not godly. It's not biblical. Find someone who's rooted and grounded. So submit to them, honor them, and obey them, that if they obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the lifestyles of their wives. Now, if the wife's lifestyle is, nya, 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 you're not going to win him. You're going to push him into hell. That is what 1 Peter 3, 1 is saying. If you can, with a holy lifestyle, live for Jesus, you'll convert that man. If he won't obey the word, you can convert him without the word. But if you're just always beating him with the word and always beating him with the word and just quoting scripture like some Christian television prophetess, you're not going to win him to Christ. That's why, likewise, just submit this is so hard for our culture. Our culture is blankety blank. You're not going to tell me what to do. Well, that's obvious. And look at the quality of your life. You and I know the culture of America, the heartbeat of America is you're not going to tell me what to do. Who do you think you are to tell me what to do? What a demonic attitude. You're not going to tell me. And if you just disagree with the littlest thing, you're not going to tell me what to do. It's a wretched way to live. And those people usually end up homeless. And nobody can tell them what to do. And then they're the ones that want to tell everybody else what to do. Please give. Please give. The horse leech has two daughters. Give. Give. Those are wretched daughters. While they behold your chaste conversation as your holy lifestyle, coupled with fear, we would say respect. Let me read that out of the New Living Translation. We don't have to throw that up. I'll just read it to you. This is all about how women can win their husbands, their godless husbands, to Christ by observing your pure and reverent lives, reverent towards God and even reverent towards them. As a man, I can tell you, if, if, a, if a person, a woman, an employee, a, a total stranger will show me respect, even if they don't agree with anything I stand for, I'm going to like them. If someone is rude and is just a social nag, I'm probably not going to be around them. I can't imagine being married to a nag. So what if that's you? What if you're the wife who just, yeah, 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 yeah. He's not going to be around you. and He's not going to tolerate you or your God. Your nagging converts no one. Your nagging converts no one. Verse 3, talking about the wife again. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair or of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. I'll read it out of the New Living just to read it. It says, Don't be concerned about the outward beauty or fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. Don't be so consumed with that. That's not the concern. Now, this is where some denominations take it too far and they say you shouldn't fix your hair and you shouldn't wear jewelry. But the last part says our clothes. <laughs> it's funny how the con those congregations draw the line there and they're not nudist colonies. I've been to some of those churches. I say, thank God they believe in denim. <laughs> and lots of it. <laughs> and this is where I always think about, I once did work at a nudist colony for a geotechnical job. I have been to a nudist colony on several occasions for a geotechnical job, and thank God it was winter. <laughs> we always throw that in there. It's eastern Indiana, we had to do drilling on the earthen dam, and the drillers were like, guess where we're going? I was like, I don't know. 
we're going to a nudist colony. For real, for real. And I had to meet with the, uh, the groundskeeper, and I thank God he had on a trench coat. I kid you not, knee-high rubber boots and a trench coat. And I'm like, thank God, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. Because the other thing I remember that really disgusted me is that there was a playground there, children's playground. And it was like a campsite where people brought in their fifth wheels. So this is, had fences all around it, but they had a lake that was upheld. And um, Indiana state law required uh, maintenance on all earth and dams, so we were drilling on it with a drill rig. So I always, when I think about nudist colonies, I always go back to eastern Indiana and the nudist colony there. And, and thank God it was winter. It's all I can say. And they had picnic tables and playground equipment. Bunch of weird perverts. Michael was telling me President Museveni of Uganda recently complained about Westerners. That's the academics of the white world. And he said something to the fact, years ago, the West came to Africa and said, you Africans are naked. You need to put on some clothes. That's the proper way. And Museveni said, and now we're wearing clothes. We're doing pretty good. And now the West comes to us and says, you, Western, you Africans are wearing too much clothing. You need to be naked. And Museveni said, make up your mind. Which is it? Pretty observant for a dictator. So please put on clothes. Something a little bit more than the Walmart um, pajama bottoms. I mean, try, just try a little, just don't try too much. Verse four, let it be the hidden man. This is what we should, ladies should be focused on. Let it be the hidden man of the heart. New Living Translation says, you should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within. That's probably the best translation of the heart of that passage. Don't be so consumed with what you look like outwardly. Yes, be beautiful. Yes, take care of yourself. Yes, groom. But what we should be more consumed with or concerned with is how beautiful our heart looks. Men and women, here the context is wives, be worried and concerned with what your heart looks like and that which is not corruptible. Clothes can corrupt, necklaces can break, hair falls out, grows back, goes gray, needs color in a bottle, does all of its thing. But that which is incorruptible is the inward beauty. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. It doesn't mean quiet vocally, but a quiet attitude. You can be vocal and still have a quiet attitude. You can also be quiet vocally and be tumultuous internally. And we have to make sure we find the balance. Verse 5, for after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, and this is what makes women holy. They're not just consumed with how they appear. That's Southern tradition and, and religiosity, having this beautiful facade and yet being wretched at home. But the holy women of old who trusted in God, they, this is how they adorn themselves, with that quiet and meek attitude being in subjection unto their own husbands. This, of course, violates modern feminism, third, fourth, and I'm sure there'll soon be a fifth wave feminism, though they're not sure what they want. Then fourth wave's not even sure what they want. It's exhausting trying to keep up with it. And I do like to point out, feminism gave birth to the Karens. Nobody likes a Karen, but feminism, that's your creation. That's your daughter. Can you not behold what you've created? Wisdom has not been justified by her children. Karens are the creation of second and third wave feminism. That's what you made. Like it or love it. That's the outward expression of what you're putting in little girls. I will speak to the manager <laughs> with a lesbian haircut. <laughs> Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well. Now you can be the daughter of Sarah or you can be the daughter of Hagar. One is the daughter of promise. The other is the daughter of flesh. And the option is here is up to you ladies. You choose. Faith makes you a daughter of Sarah. As long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. I'm going to read it in verse 5 of New Living Translation. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. Ouch. That makes a feminist screech. Did you hear that? 
made a liberal's head explode. <laughs> the restream will really cause some heads to pop. But this is what the Bible says. We're not surprised when Christians believe the Bible, or should we be? Maybe we are, because we don't study our Bible much anymore. So hear me, wives. Holy women of God who trust in God, they accept the authority of their husbands. If you don't like what he's doing, you should pray a lot more for what he's doing. Because this whole passage is how do we convert the unsaved? How do we convert the non-believing husband? How do we convert the disobedient husband? It's not through screeching. It's not through every night laying on top of him and commanding the devil to come out and commanding him to obey God in Jesus' name. He's going to roll over and say, would you shut up and go to bed? <laughs> I wouldn't want to wake up and have that happen in every night. Well, that's just the devil talking. It's not the devil talking. It's tired talking. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him her master. That, that definitely doesn't get taught in gender studies classes. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. That's a tall order. I'm going to read that to you again in New Living Translation. Verse 6. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband. In what way? She let him go sacrifice Isaac. That's her only boy. You mamas, how attached are you to that boy? You going to let your husband go sacrifice him? And she called him her master. You are her daughters when, not when you get born again, when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. It's a tall order. It takes a lot of faith to be a holy woman of God. Just because you have a Facebook ministry doesn't make you a holy woman of God. Just because you're published with Bible studies does not make you a holy woman of God. Just because you have a YouTube channel with a thousand followers does not make you a holy woman of God. When you accept your husband's authority and you obey God and accept what your husband's doing without fear of what he might do, that makes you a holy woman of God. And that's a tough calling. And most women won't have anything to do with it. But it's been in the Bible. I didn't slip this in. I teach on 1 Peter 3 a lot. It always comes out a little bit different. And it would help wives a lot to submit to the covering of their husbands. And if a husband has to raise his voice, it indicates what kind of stubbornness he's married to. The king ought to be able to just cut his eyes and scatter evil. There comes a time, though, when a woman has yelled so much, the man has lost his voice. The woman has been so emotionally unstable, so belligerent, so hostile, so he just doesn't know what to do. He just kind of retreats till the storm blows over. He treats her like a hurricane, batten down the hatches, grab some peanut butter and some extra batteries. This will be over soon. And they always seem to name hur hurricanes after women. Maybe we need to start regendering the Weather Channel. I'm thinking of Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Ida. These are all women's names. Whoever came up with that system had a horrible marriage. It's like, I can relate. Just when you think there's peace, that's just the eye of the storm. There's more hell coming. It's a trap. You come out, sun, start picking up your house and your life. Oh, no, here comes the next 78 miles. Verse 7, we should move along. We've offended every demographic in this church thus far, except Dr. James. He's so secure in Christ, I can't offend that man, and I love it because I don't have to walk on eggshells around him because he's my people. Verse 7, like we said Sunday night, if you have to walk on eggshells, you're not with your people. Sometimes family reunions, you can tell those aren't your people. Sometimes going home for Christmas, you can tell those aren't your people because you're... And that's exhausting, and I don't like doing it myself. In the same way, you husbands... All right, let's switch it up. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> that's sexist, Patty. Oh, look at the time. We should pray. We'll go home. 
<laughs> well, I can appreciate Peter. There's just one verse for the husband. There's been six verses for the women. Honestly, it's because they have a harder job to do. And they are at the beck and call and the winds of a vitriolic husband, just like uh, Nabal, the churlish fool who was married to beautiful Abigail. Uh, she just compensated for that moron. And when he died, she said, hallelujah, <laughs> went on to the king's palace. I'm not saying pray for your man to die, but I am saying <laughs> Abigail was a wise woman and she knew how to take care of her man. And the Lord delivered her one day. Don't pray for your husband to have a hard heart and die. Um, I don't even know what to take of that story. So let's just move on to <laughs> verse seven now. Because Some of you are getting ideas and you're mixing it with the word of faith doctrine. And it sounds like it's going to become murderous. Verse 7, likewise you husbands. So likewise what? Likewise wives. Likewise what? Likewise slaves. So it's all one continuous thought. By the way, they're in a persecuted season of life. So step out again, big picture. They're not at home. They're not in Israel. They're migrants. They're immigrants. They lost their possessions. They lost their wealth. They're starting over. They're being persecuted by the region, not necessarily Rome yet but by regional citizenry and governors because they're, they're foreigners. And it's not easy. And yet they're still commanded to have beautiful marriages. They're still commanded to have good work ethics. They're still commanded to respect the government. There's no hugs given here, only a call to maturity and responsibility. And this modern church movement has made the, the scriptures all about a bunch of sissy feel-goodism, and it's really detrimental to the church's strength. Here they are, displaced, dispossessed, starting from scratch, and there's still an instant calling upward. Hey, you lost your property? Hey, you lost your family inheritance? Hey, all the laws of Deuteronomy thrown out the window because you're not going home? Guess what? We still need to work on your marriage. Even in a refugee camp, we still need to work on your marriage. You still need to treat her right. You still need to trust him. I'm telling you, the modern church wants everything to be perfect before they're going to start doing anything for Jesus. And it's never going to be perfect. So likewise, you husbands, dwell with them, that is your wife, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. I teach this a lot. I've studied this a lot. I like to break it up a couple of different ways. So let me do this. Husbands. We are to dwell with our wives with all intelligent recognition or in an understanding way. New Living Translation says, treat your wife with understanding as you live together, which means we adapt for our wives. We understand her. We should be paying attention to understand her. Guys are really good at knowing how deer season works and they can follow the rut and they can follow rubbings and whatever. You can't even figure out when your wife's upset. You know how to master a video game, but you can't tell when she's having a bad day, when she's exhausted. Why are we so observant for things that are pointless and useless and we can't find, we can't unlock the Rubik's Cube that is our wife, our darling, our lover, our best friend. We're just oblivious. And this also, honey, uh, when you go to date a guy, you need to look for a guy who isn't just like knee deep in electronics. Uh, you analytical guys, you need to get some grace in your life so you can do something more than just the, the, the binary zeros and ones. Because women aren't coded with zeros and ones. They're a hexadecimal code that changes every 30 minutes. It's not like zero, one, one, zero. No, 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 no. It's like big letter, little letter, dash, little j, z, four, seven, two, hyphen, ampersand, ampersand, and then 17 more letters. And then that'll change in 30 minutes. So maybe we're the difficult one, right, Patty? We have it. I'm like, what, Lord? <laughs> it's this woman you gave me. I need a hacker. Lord, give me a Holy Ghost hack. Hey, chat GPT, what's wrong with my wife? And it just gives you dots for an hour. And then it comes back, you're on your own, buddy. <laughs> She's probably white. <laughs> I 
That's a pretty sharp cultural reference right there. Even if she's not, it's going to tell you she is. And she's the problem because she's white. Because that's how chat GPT is coded, to be bigoted. But wait, you can't be racist against white people because only white people can be racist because they're in the majority. But they're not, are they? So critical race theory is a fallacy because whites are not in the majority in the earth. We're one of the true minorities. So we should flush that theory because it's not even theoretical. It can't predict anything. It's barely a hypothesis. But boy, does it make money for the race baiters. We're not done dealing with your prejudice or your stupidity or your wretched culture. I'm trying to get you cleaned up. Back to marriage, though. Husbands, let's help us. You got to live with your wife with all intelligent recognition. And it says there's two categories that we have to honor our wives. Number one, we recognize she's weaker. And that's generally true. There are women who are bigger. We know we have different shapes and sizes. There are the big Berthas, the truck driver women who, you know, arm wrestle and wrestle, wrestle on the weekend. And occasionally they'll marry some guy that's like a buck 30 soaking wet, in which case she's not the weaker vessel, but that's not her fault. But generally speaking, we get it, right? So we're not equal. She's the weaker vessel. Fine China is my favorite translation. Guys are like terracotta, Stone Age, Tupperware. Women are fine china. But then it says, but then we are equal. We're not equal in our frame and biological design, but then we are equal as co-heirs of the joint, uh, joint heirs of the, uh, the heir, grace of life. So it's quick to tell us biologically we're not equal. So that un undoes all academia. The woke, wokery, we're not equal. We're different. Yet then... When it comes to the kingdom, we are equal. We're joint heirs together, grace of life. So we have to dwell with our wives with all intelligent recognition. We need to understand how her biology works, how her emotions work, everything that is her makeup and her creation. We have to understand it. And every wife is different. So husbands, you, you've been living with your wife long enough. You ought to be pretty good. You ought to have mastered your wife as far as her strengths, her weaknesses, and know what she needs. And at the same time, you husbands are called to disciple your wives. And wives, you ought to delight to be discipled by your husband if you haven't already emasculated his voice and his leadership by now. You have to be able to look at your wife and say, honey, let's improve some things here. And wives, you trust your husband to have the grace of life to be able to do that because he's your head. He's your leader. He's your spiritual head. I am not your spiritual head. I'm the pastor of a church, but I'm not the pastor of your home. Husbands, you got to trust that you have the grace to see things in your wife and help change it. Her parents hopefully discipled her so long, a disciple discipled her, and now that she's married, her husband should be also discipling her into the new stages of life. That's a man's grace. If you don't want that, you shouldn't get married. If you don't want to do that, men, you shouldn't get married. Your job is to help take your wife to the next level in her Christian discipleship. This again, this whole passage, this whole, all of Peter is anti-American. Everything cross plows, everything going on in our society. And yet we live it. We have joy. We have peace. Things work. You look at what the world's cranking out. They're depressed. They don't know whether to squat or stand to pee. They want to cut off perfectly healthy parts and their hair looks like a box of fruity pebbles. Something's not working. Let me read it to you out of another translation. I think uh, NIV is a pretty good one here. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as the heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. If she is the weaker vessel, then that means the man should be doing more. And we harp on this several times a year. Generally speaking, even in this church, the men don't do more than their wives. Even in this group here tonight, the wife still does more. Which means the man is not living up to his full masculine biological potential. He wakes up later. He goes to bed earlier. He goes to work, does hardly anything there unless he's like digging a ditch. Meanwhile, the wife is doing everything with the homemaking, child rearing, laundry, food prep, lunch prep, dinner prep, then he comes home. I understand feminism. Deadbeat Christian men are the reason feminism exists. And I don't fault feminism for wanting to have some freedom. 
But if men would be biblical men, feminism would not need to screech. All they're saying is respect me. And it's unfortunate. Probably the weakness of unbiblical Christianity created feminism. But then feminism created Karens. And nobody wants to be married to a Karen. Nobody wants to be friends with a Karen. Karen doesn't even want to be called Karen anymore. Huh. Verse 8, finally, be you all of one mind. Now this is interesting because it means there's no room for the individual self. We don't care what you think. Be of one mind. Well, you know what I was thinking? No, because I go places for Jesus. <laughs> Having compassion one of another. There's no room for selfishness there. You have compassion for each other. Love as brethren. There's no room for self there. Be full of pity or compassionate. Be courteous. You can't be selfish and be courteous at the same time. All of this really takes the, the onus or the, the, the focus off of the individual and puts it on others. And that's true Christianity. That we look at one another. We're like-minded in Christ. We're sympathetic. We love one another. We're compassionate. We're humble. Courteous is translated as humble in the NIV. Humility is the opposite of selfishness. Do not repay evil with evil, or don't render evil for evil, going back to chapter 2. Don't render evil for evil, and you should teach your kids. We're not finishing fights on the playground. I was taught that as a kid. I, mean, I was five years old, the neighbor boy, Keith and Todd. This is Louisiana, Baton Rouge, late 70s, early 80s. Just to let you know how I was raised. Keith and Todd lived next door. They were my brother's age and I, except they got to drink beer. I mean, kid you not, this is the late 70s, early, it's Louisiana. A lot of alcohol in Louisiana. Uh, in fact, it's what it's known for. And I remember hanging out there all the time, and Keith and Tad, Todd's dad would have a beer, and they would just go by and take a swig of it. Like, we might, a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or whatever. So one of them, I don't remember, Keith or Todd, ran his mouth and, and then pushed me or something, and we almost got in a fight. I think my dad came. I don't remember. Cleaned it up. I remember my dad telling me, son, I don't want you to ever start a fight, which is good because we're not white trash. And I've got no ghetto honor to defend because that's the other side of the coin. You know what I'm talking about. It's not racial. It's honest to God culture. But my dad then said, I don't want you to ever start a fight, but you better finish it. And I reject that notion because that's still a fight. Now, I don't blame my dad. It's the 70s. He's a World War II vet's kid. You know, we grew up on concrete playgrounds with hot steel everything. It was a different day. Unless... Unless Bone was showing, Mama didn't have sympathy on you. And even then, it's like, ah, oh, we'll get to the emergency room later. Let's pour some methylate in there. It'll be all right. <laughs> Hold it till it stops bleeding. Oh, my hands, it's wet, it's slippery. It's a different day. We don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Railing for railing, but contrary-wise, blessing. We ought to be looking for ways to de-escalate and to, to render a blessing. To render a blessing. Find a way to get the gospel in there. Now, again, I'm not faulting my dad. It was the 70s and 80s. That's the wisdom of our culture. Finish the fight. Don't start it. And there's, I get it. But how about, why not teach your kids to get Jesus in there? I don't, and especially in this culture, you don't want to, you don't even want to try to finish a fight. You don't know who's going to pull a gun or a knife. These things go south very, very quickly. Again, when I was in high school, even Seattle, there'd be a fight every week, and they just, we'd meet at the tennis courts and just cheer them on, and they just slug each other out, knowing they're both going to get in school suspension for a week. But nobody cared. Nobody brought a gun. We'd talk smack. We ran each other's mamas down. We'd meet at the tennis courts. We'll duke it out. Everybody's like, yes, and show up. It's gladiatorial for about a minute, because that's all the teenage boys had in them. And the teacher runs out there like they didn't know what was going to happen. I'm sure they were betting on it, because I would if I was a teacher. <laughs> I'm not stopping that thing kid probably had it coming, you know. All right, that's enough. That's enough. And then grab both the kids and bring them to the principal's office. Nowadays, you have a knife, you're going to have a gun for looking sideways at a stoplight. I think it's stupid, but I'm even scared in this little town to look at somebody at a stoplight. And when you do and you make eye contact, you're like, you're all of a sudden nicer than you are to your husband. Because you've got him whipped, but you don't know about this guy. It's good preaching tonight. 
Where have you guys been? All, what have you been doing all week? I like, I taught with Sunday night was calling to God. He'll show you great and wonderful things. Have you not been calling out to God? Or you have, and this is the great and wonderful, this is it. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> all right. Don't render evil for evil or railing for any contrarized blessing, knowing that you are there unto call that you should inherit a blessing. So if you pick a fight or you finish a fight, you forfeit your blessing. And I don't want my kids to be fighters. I do want them to stand up for what's right, but we don't have to come to blows. For he that will love good life, and here's where he quotes the psalmist, Psalm 34. Isn't it interesting? He says, quit picking fights, because if you want to enjoy good life, the segue here is powerful. Southern tradition would have robbed us from good life. Southern tradition, which I am a testimony, I'm a fruit of, was finish the fight. Don't start it, finish it. It's escalated to where I'm going to get you before you even think about getting me. Please understand that mindset totally strips you of any biblical blessing. He that will love good life, he that will love life and see good days. Do you want long life? You want good days? Then listen carefully to the rest of the verses. Let his, uh, him refrain his tongue from evil. That means quit talking smack. His lips that they speak no guile. That's deceitful speech. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. When it comes to a fist fight, this verse applies per perfectly. Seek peace. Don't follow 70s doctrine, which is finish the fight. Let's come, let's, let's, what's wrong? What did I do? Look, how can we de-escalate this? Let's not be white trash on the factory line duking this out because somebody's going to pick up a wrench and put somebody in a coma. The violence that's in the air escalates so rapidly anymore. The violence in the air, even in our little Christian town, the violence in the air is almost like playing with a lighter and there's a gas leak somewhere. You never know when it's going to go boom. The Bible commands us to seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And remember, these are refugees. And he's saying, quit picking fights. Quit complaining about how you've been done so wrong. You're migrants. You're not in your country. And he's still expecting them to live biblically. Verse 13, who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. We don't believe that. We think we're horribly inconvenienced if we suffer for righteousness sake. The Bible says we're happy. This is where you can command yourself to change your emotions. We rewire our value system. If I'm persecuted or mistreated for being righteous, that's instant happy. That's instant joy. I'm being mistreated because I'm a Christian. I've, I've earned it. And that's a good earning right there. I rejoice. But and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Do not fear their threats, NIV says. Do not be frightened. But sanctify the Lord in your heart, or your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let me read this in the NIV. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. But I look at this verse. We have about 10 minutes, so you don't have to keep checking your watches. I'll be done when I'm done. Don't make me call you out for your carnality. You got nothing else to do. It's not like you're going to go home and spend time with God. I mean, this is it for the rest of your week. <laughs> See, that wasn't racial. <laughs> you're only offended at the racial because that's your idol still. It is good. Says the minority who's proud to be an American who says, if this is racism, it's the best kind there is. He's from Cuba. He swam to get here. He says as much, right? Yeah. He also runs really fast too. This makes me think if they're asking you a hope, that means they can tell you got some. You don't do that with a hatchet face. I mean, if you got a hatchet face, you're the Karen. 
You don't even talk to the Karen because she's going to want to talk to the manager. And that's not you. So the Karens don't have friends. So don't worry, Karen. Nobody's going to ever ask you for your hope because they can't tell that you got any. So like Pastor Tim and, and Indy taught us, smile. It adds face value. I love it. Such a simple word of wisdom. Just have an outward expression of an inward hope. It's a song we used to sing in the 90s. I have the joy of the Holy Ghost. I have an outward expression of an inward hope. I have the joy of the Holy Ghost. We ought to be able to tell you're saved. We ought not be able to tell what kind of hell you've made for yourself this week. Joy unspeakable, full of glory. It just exudes out of you. You just tell them, man, that person's saved. That person knows God. What do they have? I don't. What, what do you got? I don't. Well, now you get to fulfill this verse. I get to tell you and give an answer with gentleness and respect. Doesn't sound like Karen. Nothing gentle about Karen. Nothing respectful about Karen. She just dares you to ask her what's going on. Oh, but she's going to tell you. And then she's going to post it. Having a good conscience so that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good lifestyle, your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so. Mm, that's where the faith people don't like it. That you suffer for well-doing. NIV says it is better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Because sometimes it is God's will that we suffer for doing good. We've all done it anyway. We've all suffered anyway. Been mistreated, been cussed, been made fun of, been called religious, been called a Sunday churcher or a church person or a Bible thumper or even worse than that. All right, so what? Called St. Andrews. What the, the judgment of God to come upon Sparta for making fun of holy people. I'd claim it. I'd start telling them, tell them, tell them those morons down there in Sparta. I'm thinking about changing our name, church of our name to St. Andrews. You want to get their goat? St. Andrew's Baptist Church. I mean, I would, I would just egg it on. I don't know if that contradicts anything I've just taught tonight. There might be some permission to be sarcastic with morons. St. Andrew's tongue-talking Baptist Church. The snakes are at the other Baptist Church. I like it. Call it St. Andrew's Baptist Church, where the holy ones are. The non-drinkers, the non-fornicators, the non-adulterers. Amen. Let's keep reading. Try to finish this up for you watch checkers. Dr. Barclay just rags the watch checkers. I'll give you, you don't have to look down to and embarrass yourself. You have, I have, I'll finish up in six minutes. You want me to go 12 just to stretch them? Go the extra mile. I feel the challenge. Ronaldo says thumbs up. All right. Because the last part of this chapter gets really weird and spooky. And we got to slow down and look at it. All right. It gets into demonology. So, all right. Let's, so, it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. This is where it gets weird. Jesus went and preached to spirits in prison? Now, I recently heard a sermon where a great minister said, we don't know what this means. And I thought, what, what do you mean we don't know what this means? I checked a bunch of modern translations. They all get what it means. It's very evident and clear. Maybe the implication is a little mystical, but it's very clear in the text that Jesus, after he died, being put to death in the flesh, verse 18, but quickened by the Spirit, he went to a prison and preached to spirits. So that makes this a spirit prison. Let me read it to you, to you in the NIV because it brings a little bit more clarity. Verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Verse 19, after being made alive, that is resurrected, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits 
So once again, we have something really spiritual going on. Jesus Christ has been quickened by the Spirit of God. If you study the Bible, we know that Jesus went to hell. But this also requires a bit, a bit of an understanding of the nature of hell, whether it's Sheol, Hades, whether it's Tartarus, whether it's the abyss. The Bible teaches us in Luke 15 that in the grave, that's Sheol, the place of the departed, also called Hades, the place of the departed. Everybody prior to Christ went to the grave. But the grave is either the word Sheol in Hebrew or Hades in the Greek. It's translated hell. It's the underworld. Everybody went there. Luke 15, the, not the parable, but the story of Lazarus. It's not a parable because a person's name is mentioned. The parables never include, include specific names. Jesus tells the story of Lazarus who died. He didn't go to heaven because he can't because Jesus hasn't been resurrected yet. He goes to Abraham's bosom in paradise and he sees a great gulf. That's what the revelation calls the abyss over which there's a king called Apollyon or Abaddon in the bottom. And then on the other side is torments. And he sees the rich man in torments. So that tells us that prior to the resurrection, everybody went to hell. That would include Jesus. But hell had paradise and torments. Christians who don't study the Bible or this aspect of soteriology don't like to acknowledge it. But this is a doctrine that goes back to the first century Truthfully, it goes back to the Psalms when Psalm 16 says, you will not leave my soul in. Well, if not being left there, you had to get there first. You can't be left a place you never went. All right. So Jesus goes to hell. Psalm 16 says so. Acts 2 says so. Uh, says again later in Acts. And he preaches. He preaches, he leads the captive train, that is the saints, out of Abraham's bosom in paradise. But before doing so, he evidently preaches to these prisoners, these spiritual prisoners. Now, what's wonderful is Peter tells us who they are in this instance. And the question that I don't have the answer for is, why specifically this group of prisoners? Because it's a very specific group. There isn't another group mentioned, but we believe... I've heard it preached. I believe it. You don't, it's conjecture. You don't have to believe it. But I can see the Lord Jesus standing in the resurrection over the gulf, preaching to everybody in hell. But Peter tells us specifically one group that he preached to, the spirits in prison. And verse 19 and 20 tells us who they are. Verse 19, NIV again. You can follow along whatever translation you have. After being made alive, he went and proclaimed made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago. So this is a specific group of prisoners. Every prison has different types of prisoners. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. So now we have a specific type of prisoner. All those that were wiped out by Noah's flood. And that's interesting. Why is that? I don't have the answer. It's just Hypothetical question. Why is that the group mentioned here? Why not the other cursed and damned? Why not the rich man? He's not mentioned. And he certainly wasn't one alive in the days of Noah, but he went to preach to those spirits in prison. Those spirits belonged to those who in the days of Noah were alive while the ark was being built and they rejected the ark. They rejected the salvation of God in that day. All right, verse 20 again, NIV. To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people ate and all were saved through water. And that's all Peter says. He just throws it out there and just keeps moving. And that's where I would have said, um, excuse me, I would have interrupted the sermon. Stop. Can we discuss that for a little bit? Now, who's got an alarm set for me? I'm not done preaching. I'm going to go another 25 minutes. Good gravy. Really, it's 8.30. Did you need an alarm for that? <laughs> Somebody did that on purpose. I'm going to make these last four verses last forever. Let's look at each word in the Greek and the root of the Greek and the cognate in the Greek. Let's follow the Latin into the modern English through French. <laughs> Hannah, get a microphone. I need help. Wee oui, wee. Oui. For whatever reason, there's something special about those that rejected the first ark. 
because we know the church is the present ark. And the early church believed that even the church as an ark, it's the reason the Latin calls the, the church sanctuary the nave for naval vessel, for, for a, a vessel is laid out like a ship. Because the doctrine for hundreds of years before we got too cool for theology was that the church is the last day's ark of safety and it's a long time in building and there's judgment coming and if you're not in, you're going to hell and you get to be a part of the spirits that were rejected. I did just see in the UK, I think, last weekend or two weekends ago, a church committed high blasphemy by having an event called Rave in the Nave. Had a dance club, nightclub, a rave in the nave trying to get folks to come to their church. Dr. S uh, Hilton Sutton said before he died, the modern church has lost track of God and doesn't know how to get him back, so now they resort to any technique possible to draw people. Google it. Rave in the nave. Blasphemy. Nobody comes because there's no God there. And the rave isn't going to bring them. Eight in all were saved through water, verse 21. And this water symbolizes baptism. Symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body. That is not just getting wet. But the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation because it does a little bit better job. And that water is a picture of baptism. So the water that wiped out those who were in hell in a special prison, that same water saves you and I. It's the judgment of God. And it, it separates those who are on board from those who are not on board. The water, concept of water baptism separates those who are on board with Jesus from those who are not on board. But Peter does say, not, uh, not the removing dirt from your body, but as, God, as a response to God from a clean conscience. It's all about the heart and your heart crying out to God. Have you been cleansed with pure water? Does your heart say, Lord, I want to be a part of what you're doing. Lord, I want to be a part of your last day's move. Lord, I want to be a part of this project Amen. called the last day's ark of safety. And once you commit to a church, you don't hop around like a church tramp. Amen. And <laughs> I mean, thank God there's lots of churches being built, lots of boats. We've got a much bigger population today. But you don't get to just hop from Noah's boat to Lamech's boat to Ethan's boat to Ehud's boat. Come on. Like, be able to say, I helped lay the keel, and I'm putting on the last door too. I've been here every step of the way. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which affirms that water is not what saves but the pledge of a clean conscience towards God. You can't really pledge yourself to Jesus if your conscience isn't clean. And that heart that says, Lord Jesus, wash me. Lord Jesus, use me. Lord Jesus, let people be able to see on my face I walk with you. I mean, I get it. Sometimes we have a bad week, but when your bad week's a bad five years, we need to hold you underwater a little bit longer. <laughs> Shake a little bit. Verse 22, now Christ has gone to heaven. So now we pick up the story. He's in preaching to the saints in prison, excuse me, the, prison, the prisoners, the spirits in prison, and now he's in heaven. He's not down there anymore. Peter wants to confirm that. Not, we don't leave him, we don't leave Jesus in this spiritual prison preaching. Peter and Paul and Silas, they went to prison. They preached there too. They came out too. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authority and powers accept his authority. King James says, angels and authorities and powers be made subject unto him. We like that part a lot. Everything is subjected to the name of Jesus. So there's 12 extra minutes. Finish up chapter three. Dealt with a lot of things. Tonight felt like whack-a-mole. We're not sheep, sheep herding tonight. We're mole whacking tonight. I wouldn't have to whack if you weren't such a mole. Be a sheep, you can be shepherded. Be a mole, you get thumped. And I'm the one that does all the sweating. That's where you need somebody here. Grab, grab one of these and just help me whack these. It's better than skee ball tickets. Go buy an overpriced unicorn. 
at Chuck E. Cheese with overpriced pizza. That's a $500 day right there. You learn anything? Have you been offended? Oh, really? I was by your behavior. So <laughs> mostly the watch checking. No, no. I've pastored long enough. It doesn't offend me. It disappoints me, but it doesn't offend me. Like, seriously, it's a Wednesday night. What, what do we do? This is what we do. We're always done by about 8.30. I don't even have to look at the clock, and I can bring a message in in an hour and 15 minutes. It just works that way. So, all right. We're better now. Better wives, better husbands. We're not going to pick fights. We're not going to be white trash. We're not going to be ballers, gangster thugs, you know, with a gat in our britches. <laughs> and listen, everybody peddles in stereotypes. And there's truth to all stereotypes. If you don't like it, don't live according to one. Be the stereotype breaker. Amen. Let's bow our heads here and pray. We'll go home before somebody else's alarm goes off. Father, thank you for the word tonight. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for the liberty in our church to be able to laugh at ourselves and pick ourselves apart and do better. Lord, we love you. We trust you. And we thank you for the word of God that wants to help our marriages, wants to help us as wives, wants to help us as husbands, wants to help us as singles, wants to help us as citizens of heaven in an oppressive earth, but in a great country but a country that's slowly turning on the church. Help us, Lord, to endure hardness. Help us to rejoice if need be that we are in heaviness through manifold trials, knowing that the trial of our faith is more precious than gold that perishes. Help us, Lord, to see the leaks in our faith. Help us to see the, the carnality in our emotions. Help us to see maybe where we're Karens and nobody's drawn to us because we're so hostile in our appearance. May we not be like some animal in your creation, whose appearance says, get back, because I'm dangerous. May our appearance be inviting. May we be easily entreated so that people can approach us on anything, including salvation. I thank you for blessing these marriages. Help those that are struggling with private issues. May these wives be fortified to be like Mother Sarah. May their husbands convert and become like Father Abraham. We thank you for helping us to serve you. Thank you for saving us and allowing us to live in these last days. In Jesus' name. Pray this after me. We'll go home. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the New Testament. Thank you for these epistles that speak to us where we are. Change us, Lord. Challenge us. Do not leave me the same. Give me someone to lead to Christ. Give me a prayer assignment. Show me what to study next in my Bible, and I will serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, love on somebody. It's 838. You're still doing good on time. We'll see you Sunday morning. Gertie's teaching on Ezra and Nehemiah. I'm trying to do some prop Bible prophecy stuff. Don't know how well that's going to go again. And then Sunday night, I plan to teach on ministry ordination, try to wrap up teaching on the sacraments. And uh, so that's what we plan for the rest of the week. But go have a great time. Enjoy the rest of the week. It's going to be wintry and rainy. Love you all. Be dismissed.